Good morning. Welcome to the October 24th, 2024 meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District Board of Directors. Would the clerk please call the roll? Vice Chair Aquino? Here. Director Desmond? Director Frost? Here. Director Guetta? Director Hume? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. Director Maple? Director Middleton? Director Papineau? Here. Director Robles? Director Serna? Here. Director Serna? I'm here. <laughs> Director Terry? Director Thau? Here. Director Vang? Here. We have quorum. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item is the clerk Don't you want, announcement. Do you, have, do you have announcements? Yes. Members of the public are encouraged to observe the meeting in real time at metro14live.saccounty.gov, participate in person via Zoom video or teleconference line, and by submitting written comments to board clerk at airquality.org. Comments will be delivered to the Board of Directors. Public comments regarding matters under the jurisdiction of the Board of Directors will be acknowledged by the chairperson, distributed to the Board of Directors, and included in the record. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast and AT&T UVerse cable systems. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be live streamed at metro14live.saccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated on Saturday, October 26th, 2024 at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Thank you very much. And just for the board to know, we're going to lose some members at 10 o'clock. So um, we're going to try to run this meeting as efficiently as possible. At, uh, item number one is board member rec service recognition, Dr. Ayala. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board. Uh, good, to, good to see you all for the last time this uh, calendar year. Um, we don't want to miss the opportunity to recognize four of you uh, that are not coming back next year. Uh, we, we couldn't do what we do without you. You are, um, you are what makes things happen here in the region. And the best ideas that we come up with um, cannot be implemented without your support. And um, for those of you that are leaving us, I want you to know that we appreciate very much uh, not only your support, but your engagement, uh, even, even in the times where you disagree with what we were trying to do. So um, that is what the process is for. And, and again, we don't want to miss the opportunity to recognize uh, what, what you have contributed to, to the mission of this agency. The departing members are Director Thao. Uh, thank you for your engagement. You've been with us only a short time, uh, but we know you're not going anywhere, and neither are we, so we look forward to continue to, to work with you in your, in your community efforts. Uh, Director Papano, thank you for representing uh, Galt and Alton. I uh, appreciate it, um, your, your engagement and help. And uh, longstanding members, uh, Director Frost and Director Terry, uh, you guys have been here since, since I got here seven years ago, and... Uh, I really appreciate uh, what you have done for, for me personally uh, in this role, but also for the agency. So um, if you would uh, indulge us, we have uh, some small tokens of appreciation. Uh, why don't we gather, take a quick picture, and then we can move on. Great. Do we have somebody to take a photo? Yep. I'll then, then let's get the whole board down there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
You guys typed into that, right? <laughs> We're not doing it again. <laughs> we'll get one at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, um, and thanks for taking that time. Uh, thanks to those members who are departing. Um, you know, we appreciate your service. Uh, the community is a better place because of you, and uh, wish you all the best, Supervisor Frost. Well, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Ayala and the staff. Uh, it's very nice of you to recognize us. And I also want to say I didn't realize I was here since 2014. So I was here at my city and at the county. That's a long time. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about um, all the things that impact air quality, which is more than just... Um, you know, emissions, it's where the wind blows and the geography and there are fires and so such an interesting work. And I want to thank all of you for especially your, um, Dr. Ayala, you've been amazing. Um, I've appreciated the way you've managed the budget in such a, a sensible way. Um, not all the boards we serve on have, have been able to, to do that. Um, and I also want to thank you for all the work that you've done to search for funding um, for projects uh, that impact other areas of the county and uh, the good work that you all do. So thank you. And I know that you're going to like, I think you're going to like the person who takes my seat and you'll enjoy working with uh, Supervisor Rodriguez. Uh, um, she'll, she'll be a great representative. So thank you very much for this. Director Tao. Thank you, uh, Chair Kennedy. Uh, Dr. Ayala, thank you for this uh, recognition. And, and I am the newest member on the board here. And uh, you know, during my short time, I realized you know, I was a, a city staff. And uh, coming from a staff and being on board is really different. But then I, I am so happy about the experience that I got to gain here with board, working with you, Dr. Ayala, and the great things that we do here for the city of Sacramento and the region as well. Uh, definitely, but I, I will still be in the community. As you said, I run a nonprofit and looking forward to working with the boards and the directors on how we can improve that outreach and engagement. And so thank you so much. Thank you, Director. Okay, that takes us to our consent calendar. And uh, we have items two through seven. I do believe we have public comment on an item. Madam Clerk. Yes, Chair, I have uh, Shala Costello and Chambers to give public comment. Now's the time. Okay. Good morning, morning, Chair Kennedy and fellow board members. My name is Shiloh Costello. I serve as a manager of sustainable communities and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at SMUD. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. As you all know, SMUT's 2030 Clean Energy Vision is anchored in our longstanding commitment to provide safe and reliable power with rates among the lowest in California. And as a leader in climate innovation, our regional partners like AQMD are helping SMUD position the Sacramento region as a model for others around the nation to follow. And in 2022, SMUD launched our Community Impact Plan, ensuring our most under-resourced customers can actively participate in our clean energy transition. The Community Impact Plan addresses three core pillars. The first one is affordability. We commit to providing solutions that increase the energy affordability of our customers. Equitable access, we're creating job training and placement opportunities for underrepresented individuals, leading to high-paying careers in the clean energy transition and sector. 
and community engagement, leveraging trusted community-based partnerships. We're connecting and building deeper relationships with our customers and our most vulnerable communities. And we're really centering their lived experiences and the design of these programs that will ultimately impact their lives. Specifically amongst our um, under-resourced business corridors, our partnership with AQMD allows us to deepen our collective impact and investments in clean mobility solutions so all customers can benefit from a clean energy transition. Thank you for your leadership, your partnership on projects like the Del Paso Heights Mobility Hub and the Future Community Resource Project Center and Mobility Hub in South Sacramento. Our collective actions allow for a more just and equitable clean energy transition for all. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Um, today's a day of district partners. We have Smud and SACOG in the house, so that's a good thing. <clears throat> any other public comments? Is there any comments from the board? Is there a motion? I'll move adoption of the consent calendar. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, next item, please. The next item on the agenda, the public hearing, item number eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Contingency measures for the 2008 and 2015 ozone standards, revisions to the state implementation plan, Rule 489, green, po green waste composting operations, and Rule 490, liquefied petroleum gas transfer and dispensing. Um, please note that there has been main, minor changes to the rule and the resolution. Updated versions have been provided to the board as well and additional materials. Staff will discuss the changes during the presentation. Give me one second and I'll pull up your PowerPoint. And I have Mark Cooley in chambers to give his presentation. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. My name is Mark Cooley and I'm here today to present uh, proposed contingency measures for the 2008 and 2015 ozone standards. Uh, I'm Mark Cooley. I work in the monitoring, planning, and rules division at the district. Next slide, please. Sacramento County is part of the Sacramento Federal Non-Attainment Area, commonly referred to as the SFNA, shown here. It's comprised of the following districts, and this region, the SFNA, is designated as a severe non-attainment area for both the 2008 and 2015 ozone standards. Next slide, please. For areas that are in non-attainment, EPA requires a plan to identify how the region will come into attainment. That plan for the 2008 standard was disapproved for the lack of contingency measures. The 2015 plan is still under review. The disapproval, it's a partial disapproval, was due in part to recent actions by court decisions that required EPA to come up with a guidance to identify how many contingency measures would be required. Next slide, please. So contingency measures are rules that trigger if and only if the region fails to attain the standard or the region fails to make progress towards those standards. And these are rules that will trigger automatically if EPA makes one of those findings. And these rules also need to be in those plans. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So staff identified these measures as the proposed contingency measures shown here and the districts that are responsible for each of these rules. Of a note, the architectural coatings rules have already been adopted by all the districts in the region as contingency measures. I will be covering the composting and the propane transfer and dispensing rules today. Next slide, please. Staff held outreach shown here with a public workshop and noticed this plan revision as shown. Staff did not receive any comments during the public comment period on this plan revision. Next slide. Staff's recommendation is to conduct a public hearing for this plan revision, determine the revision is exempt from CEQA, approve the adoption of the resolution of the SIP revision, and then direct staff to forward this revision 
to CARB for forwarding to EPA to stop the sanctions associated with the disapproval. And then I'll pause here for questions. Are there any questions at this time? Yes. Thank you. I do just have a, a couple of questions. Um, and some of them are kind of 30,000 foot level and then I'll get down into the specifics. And so the first is, is, are, is rule 489 and rule 490, are those district generated rules or are those rules that are established within the SIP or, or coming from EPA or some outside? Those are going to be new district rules um, and they're, they're contingency measures. So we're going to, if you adopt them, they will be rules on the books, but they won't go into effect unless EPA makes a finding. And then, they are uh, okay, so I guess what I'm asking though is, are these contingency measures specifically directed by EPA as something that we need to address? I'm seeing a nodding head over here. Yeah, um, I wanna emphasize, EPA was challenged by the courts because they were not very explicitly including these contingencies in these plans, and that's why if we want our plan to be approved, and I think we all do, we need to put this in there. However, I wanna remind you, this is if and only if we do not make attainment. The reason we're here, and certainly as an air pollution control officer, my number one job is to get the region to attainment. So I just wanna lower the, the level of concern. These rules are an administrative technicality for the plans to be approved. Okay. Appreciate that clarification. So now drilling down on Rule 489, the only business that it would affect is uh, located within the, the district that I represent, Lopez Ag Products, um, who I think provide a beneficial reuse of green waste byproduct that would otherwise uh, probably just not be diverted and end up in our landfill. Um, and so it gets to go back out into the continuum of agriculture as fertilizer, and, and obviously we all like to eat, so that's an important consideration. Uh, and so it's a projected uh, compliance cost of a little over $41,900 a year, which in government parlance may not seem like a lot of money, but that's potentially an additional job for this company. Um, or it's the difference between them being able to be generous and, and donate transfers of compost to a uh, nonprofit for, for a fundraiser, which I've seen them do. Um, and so I, I'm just curious how that figure is calculated given that elsewhere uh, under financial considerations, it says that implementation of Rule 489 will not require additional staff resources. May, may I suggest, Director Hume, we actually have staff presentations for each, each of the rules. May I suggest that we proceed and then get into your question when we get there? I'm happy to hold my okay. questions. I thought yeah. this was the conclusion of the presentation. This is actually, <laughs> this is just the <laughs> intro. We have to have you take action on each of the rules. I, I usually recommendations are at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Oh, thank you. Um, and as I mentioned, here's proposed rule new 489 for green waste composting operations. Next slide. The composting we're talking about is the aerobic decomposition of organic waste. Organic waste being materials from gardening, agricultural landscaping, such as tree trimmings, grass clippings, uh, up to 20% manure. Um, next slide, please. To Compost the organic material, it's typically done with windrows. You can see that here in the picture, basically a little pyramid pile. Uh, you put out the material and it decomposes. The majority of those emissions are within 15 days of the initial formation of that pile. Next slide. As mentioned, the rule would apply to one facility in Sacramento that has a solid waste permit for composting. That's Lopez Agricultural Services. The rule does not apply to minor composting facilities listed here that would not have uh, a solid waste permit, just large facilities of composting. Next slide, please. The rule requires best management practices. So it would require the source to do these things, which um, the source is doing a couple of these already, which is to use the material within 10 days of receiving it cover new piles with finished compost, which really does most of the work for reducing emissions, 
and then making sure that there's sufficient water on the piles uh, to also help reduce those emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as with other district rules, there is record keeping and reporting requirements that the source must maintain. They're maintaining some of these already, but some of these are new requirements and they must submit these annually to the district. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the, the rule does reduce emissions significantly by 34 tons per year of VOC. It does that at a very cost-effective rate of 79 cents per pound of emission reduced, which is within the range of previously adopted district rules. Next slide. As far as outreach, staff did meet directly with the affected source uh, and notice today's hearing as shown. Uh, the source did not have any comments on the proposed rule. However, since we posted this presentation, the district did receive EPA comments. Those comments and staff's responses to them is included in the package handed to you today. Uh, staff had to make some non-substantive changes in response to those comments, uh, removing a couple sections that deal with providing an alternative testing method that's not defined, uh, and EPA is not approving those kind of exemptions anymore. So uh, in your packet, you find a revised rule and a revised resolution uh, that identifies those sections that are, again, non-substantive, uh, and those changes don't change the emission limits, don't, don't, do not impose any new requirements on that source. Uh, they're simply done administratively to allow EPA to approve our rule. And then next slide. Again, staff's recommendations for this is to conduct a public hearing for the rule, determine the adoption is exempt from CEQA, adopt a resolution approving, adopt the revised resolution approving the revised rule with those changes and then direct staff to forward these documents to CARB for submittal to US EPA. And I'll pause here for questions again before my next presentation. So if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll um, ask Mark Latzenheiser to describe for Director Hume and the board some of the conversations that we've had with the actual affected uh, source. Great. Thank you, uh, Director Kennedy, Director Hume, and all board members as well. So as mentioned in Mark's presentation, we actually went out to Lopez Ag. Since it's one source, uh, they're willing to meet with us. We went out to their site, joined them at the facility. As Mark indicated, they did not actually have any uh, questions or concerns on it, and although they're not committed to it, and certainly we weren't requiring it at this point because it is only a contingency measure, they were actually quite interested that just covering the piles would result in 40% reductions, and the discussions on site at least indicated that they were interested in trying it, regardless of the rule going into effect, just to be good stewards of the community since covering it with existing compost material would create such reductions, and he felt it was meaning, or fairly unimpactful to their operation to go ahead and cover the piles. Most of the other operations, the pieces they're watering it are typically uh, normal practice for these operations. And even at the cost effectiveness that was listed uh, about two slides previously, I believe, at about 79 cents a pound, that is based on the assumption that these type of activities aren't occurring at all. And so that, that would be the new cost to the source. But at least based on our discussions with uh, Lopez directly, they did not have concerns, and as I said, we're actually interested in maybe trying these regardless, just because of the community benefit. Thank you for that clarification. Not arguing against the logic behind <laughs> these measures, but the frog doesn't realize it's in boiling water until it's too late. <laughs> and so I'm just trying to get a handle on uh, how that cost was calculated. And so I want to drill down on what you just said relative to cost effectiveness of 79 cents per pound. And then we're going to hear that again in the next uh, item uh, relative to the VOC reduced. How is that figure calculated again? I, I think you, you touched on it, but I'd like you to say it again. Absolutely. So when we do the cost effectiveness, it's based on two factors. One, what is the expected annual cost to a source? In this case, it's mostly operational costs, so those costs are just the, the annual increase in usually operating costs, a lot of times staff in this case. If there was, was equipment involved, then that equipment cost would also be annualized out as well. And so that would be both pieces would come into it. That is the dollar portion of the per year. The Pound reduced is based on how many tons of pollution are reduced by the control measure. In this case, that's uh, I believe it was mid 30 tons according to this slide for this particular rule. And so you convert that over to pounds 
and then it's the, just simply a straight math of dollars divided by the pounds reduced. And then we do compare that to where we have been at with other measures over the years. And we've also, you may have noticed there was the district reference was the very bottom part of that slide. And one of, that's something we've been adding in the last couple of years when we do rulemaking, is to make sure that we're actually in line with where we are for best available control technology. So when a new source comes in and is required under our other existing rules, we want to make sure that we're in line with that, that we're not going way outside of those cost-effective ranges. And so that is an additional trigger that we look at to make sure that we're not hopefully, obviously any additional cost is some level of burden, but what is a hopefully a as reasonable as possible burden on sources. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, clarification. I appreciate my colleagues' indulgence allowing me to ask these questions. And then the last thing I'll say is I did read through the EPA comments on the proposed language. And um, while I don't disagree that the squeeze ball test might be the most effective <laughs> way uh, of, of determining whether or not we're achieving our goals, it seems a little bit petty to not allow the wiggle room to say there might be something that comes along in the future. So that's just a, an aside as an opinion. Thank you. Appreciate for what, it. For what that one last one is worth, uh, we actually had an extended discussion with them to exactly that point because things are always changing. Yeah. You know, we may have a new source come in. We may have the county decide that, hey, they want to do composting, and what happens if someone's proposing something like active remediation? That would be better. Mm -hmm. than what we're proposing. And to have to you know, come back and modify the rule down the road didn't make the most sense to us, but uh, that's our current direction. Job security. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Chair Kennedy. Uh, and then the last uh, presentation here is for proposed Rule 490, uh, Petroleum Transfer and Dispensing. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, petroleum is used as a fuel, and the purpose of this rule is to require, again, best management practices to limit the fugitive emissions of propane when doing transfer and dispensing. Again, this is a contingency measure. Next slide, please. Uh, rule 490 would apply uh, to propane bulk plants and distributors and suppliers, retail transfer and dispensing facilities, and facilities that refill uh, barbecue cylinders and residential tanks. Um, and this applies to that transfer and dispensing of propane to limit the emissions. Next slide, please. The rule requires <coughs> either low emission fixed level gauges that reduce the emissions when fueling or, and low emission connectors or to fuel by weight. And the rule also has some requirements for leak detection and repair to make sure you minimize the leaks, and there are reporting and record keeping requirements similar to our other district rules. Next slide, please. This rule is estimated to reduce emissions by 73 tons per year of VOC, and the cost effectiveness is about $5 a pound uh, per VOC reduced, which is within the range of the other district rules. Next slide, please. Again, staff conducted public outreach for this rule uh, and noticed the workshop and the board hearing as identified here. Uh, and then staff did receive comments. Next slide. The Western Propane Gas Association did provide a couple comments uh, shown here and staff's response to those comments are here as well. Uh, no changes were made to the rule uh, in response to these comments. Next slide, please. Again, the recommendation here is to conduct a public hearing, determine the proposed rule 490 is exempt from CEQA, adopt the resolution approving the rule, and direct staff to forward these documents to CARB for submittal to US EPA. And then my presentation's over. I'll take any questions. Okay, any questions? I have one on the smaller cylinders for like barbecues and that type of thing that you mentioned. <clears throat> Is that affecting the institutional filling station type of situation and not retail point of sale? Uh, yes. So for the barbecue tanks, um, the ones you take in and exchange, uh, that's on those retailers. Um, the residential tanks that are a little bit larger that are typically yeah. leased by the 
I'm just saying, are we asking are the, 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 the small mom and pop uh, hardware store that that offers these things for exchange? They're not necessarily going to be impacted. It's at the filling station. Correct. That's what I want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, I will open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the public at this time that would like to address the board on this item? Can you please, can you please state your name? Good morning, my name is Evan Edgar. I'm the engineer for the California Compost Coalition. We're a statewide organization of public and private commercial and agricultural composters. We're over 50, 60 facilities. We represent most of the organic certified compost market. Uh, we get certified by California Department of Food and Ag, mostly with green waste. And there's a state law called SB 1383, got to divert 75% of the organics from the landfill. When these organics are in a landfill, it causes a lot of VOCs, a lot of emissions. So that's the worst case scenario, and that's baseline. When we divert the compost, compost from the landfills, it's a lot better, we, a lot of co-benefits. The climate action plan for both the city and the county has carbon farming as a, as a key component. And that's really important to keep the organics in the healthy soils and have formed a fork. So it's a good deal. Um, most of the burden of composting is not on Sacramento County. When the city and county approved the contracts, you sent um, um, Yolo County as a commercial compost facility. And they're taking about a third of the compost. So that's a Yolo Sloan Air Quality District, which has a lot tougher rules. About a third of it goes north up to um, Yuba County with Recology. And they have a commercial compost facility and they have controls up there. What stays in the county is mostly agriculture. And the rules you have today are pretty reasonable compared to other air districts, but it's still a, a burden. Um, you guys talked to Lopez Ag as the only commercial compost facility in Sacramento County, and that's correct. I heard there's another one coming down in Twin Cities. I'm not here for that, but people will be coming in to have a, a fair share of um, composting in Sacramento County. What was mentioned here is that the exemptions only go so far. There was um, four different exemptions that you listed on backyard composting and some um, recreational, I think they meant, um, um, recreational and other, he had, he had a list of them up there. And, but there's another tier of, of non-permits at, at Cow Recycle. I have a list from the Cow Recycle homepage here. And there's a, it's not a solid waste facilities permit, it's called an enforcement agency notification tier. That's when the county health department goes out once a year to go out to agricultural composting. And I have, from the Cow Recycle homepage, I got three facilities that are in Sacramento County that weren't contacted. And these are agriculture people. There's a Nielsen Farming, Silva Ranch, and, Ag and um, Van Vleck are the three different facilities. And they're all on a farm. They compost on a farm. They keep the compost out there. And it's really bringing back a lot of um, habitat, biodiversity. And we're creating carbon credits. I'm working with the um, uh, uh, voluntary carbon market to have these agriculture people help pay for this, this ain't cheap to spread compost among the, among the farmlands. And the co-benefits for farming are unbelievable. It's a, it's a great benefit. So what I suggest today, my ask as part of this rule uh, 489, to expand the exemption to include agriculture composting. Um, it's, one, it's not a solid waste facilities permit from cow recycle, it's a lesser tier, and once a year it gets inspected. So um, I think it's a great benefit carbon farming for carbon credits for Sacramento County. And if we can exempt agricultural composting from rule 489, I think I'll be the best for Sacramento County. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Just for the benefit of the record, I want to point out that the speaker referenced the county's uh, climate action plan. That is a plan that's in draft form, has not been adopted yet. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Any other members of the public? We will close the public hearing. Board? Chair, I'd appreciate a, a response from staff relative to the speaker's comments. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
in answer to the, or in partial answer to the question, obviously we will want to talk and have a little bit more discussion on it, but I believe, and I don't want to speak for the member of the public that just, did just present, but if I understood him correctly, he did indicate that these ag operations are not subject to the solid waste permit. And so the rule as written right now only applies if you require a solid waste permit. So by default, those operations would already be exempt. Can we verify that? Yeah, I think what I would suggest, Chair, and uh, yeah, I'm not asking for it in real time. Right, I'm just, right. Can you get back to me? And let exactly. me know. Okay, absolutely. Thank but you. yes, the intent in the rule was only to apply if the for sources that have a solid waste permit. And I will confirm with the gentleman in the audience as well that those operations are not subject. I believe that was his words right now. But we'll talk with him afterwards just to verify that. But as long as they do not have a solid waste permit, this rule would not apply to them. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Please vote. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Next item, please. The next item on the agenda is <coughs> item number nine. Air Toxics Hotspots Program and Report AB 2588, and I have Matt Baldwin and Chambers Day presentation. Give me one second and I'll switch these out. Good morning, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. I am uh, Matt Baldwin with the Engineering and Compliance Division, and I'm here to present the 2024 Air Toxics Hotspots Report. Uh, next slide, please. So the Air Toxics Hotspots Act is a state-mandated lo state local program, and the report on the district's program is required by California Health and Safety Code. Uh, the findings of the report <coughs> must be presented at a public hearing. Um, and after the report is published and presented, the district is required to disseminate the report to public health officials and uh, local governments. Um, but before I go on, I'd like to give a little background on uh, the Air Toxics program. Next slide, please. So first, why are we concerned about toxic air pollution? Um, toxic air pollutants are linked to several health effects, including uh, cancer, uh, uh, dizziness, fatigue, eye and skin and lung irritation. And additionally, um, we encounter these pollutants in everyday life. Uh, chemicals like benzene and xylene are found in gasoline and then uh, diesel particulate matter is common among roadways and highways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with with these pollutants in our environment, uh, what do we look at when determining whether a facility poses a health risk? Uh, first, we look at to look to see if a toxic air contaminant is being emitted. Uh, this is any substance that's emitted into the air that has been identified by having an adverse impact on human health. After identifying what is being emitted, we then assess uh, the cancer risk and or the non-cancer risk. The cancer risk is the probability of a person developing cancer as a result of a lifetime of exposure to a carcinogen. And this is uh, expressed in uh, chances per uh, one million people. A hazard index is a measure of non-cancer health effects resulting from exposure to chemicals. The hazard index signals whether such chronic <coughs> or acute health effects are likely from exposure. Next slide, please. With this information, how do we regulate and control emissions of toxic air contaminants? The US EPA, CARB, and the Air District all play a role in identifying and reducing emissions from air, toxic air contaminants. EPA and CARB identify hazardous air pollutants or toxic air contaminants. They also set standards for major sources or other categories of sources of national or statewide concern. Additionally, they implement and enforce measures for on-road and mobile sources, provide oversight, and create inventories of mod and model certain toxics. The Air District then incorporates these requirements into its permitting and hotspots program, 
including reviewing applicability of state and federal programs and verifying compliance with these programs, identifying emitted toxics and running health risk assessments for new and modified permits, notifying nearby schools of new or modified sources of toxics, and reviewing applicability of the hotspots program for existing sources. Next slide, please. With all these regulatory requirements, what does the overall risk look like in Sacramento? The California Air Toxics Assessment Study estimated that the total cancer risk for Sacramento County is about 395 in a million, which has dropped uh, since 2012 from a value of 706 in a million. And statewide, the average is 598 in a million. Uh, with the primary co contributor being diesel particulate matter. Uh, next slide, please. Now that we have some background, what is the Hotspots Information and Assessment Act? The act was in enacted by the legislature in 1987 in response to growing public awareness of toxic chemicals being released into the atmosphere. The primary goals of the act are to identify permitted facilities with the potential for risk and assessing health impacts, reducing risk from high risk facilities, and informing the public of those risks. Next slide, please. When the Air District identifies a source that is subject to the act, the first step is to collect an emissions inventory detailing the facility's emissions. Using that information, we prioritize facilities into high, intermediate, or low categories. Any facility categorized as a high priority, we then conduct or ask the facility to conduct a health risk assessment. After review, we then categorize the facility as high risk, low risk, or intermediate. Any facility that is categorized high is then subject to public notification and risk reduction measures. Next slide, please. So who is in the program? We have two key types of facilities in the program, uh, core facilities and industry-wide facilities. Core facilities are generally larger facilities that have higher emissions, usually from multiple emission sources. Uh, the facility is responsible for submitting data and, if necessary, conducting a health risk assessment. Industry-wide categories are generally small business facilities that have a single source of emissions that can be easily categorized and assessed. The facility is responsible for submitting throughput information and the Air District conducts the health risk assessment for those facilities. The two most common are gas stations and diesel engine facilities for industry-wide sources. As you can see, most of our sources are industry-wide facilities. Next slide. As I mentioned previously, one of the first goals is to prioritize and identify core facilities. Uh, prioritization is a type of screening assessment that ranks facilities by their potential for risk. Overall, the district has identified four high priority facilities that have a, a score greater than 10, 10 intermediate facilities with a score between one and 10, and three low priority facilities with a score less than one. Uh, next slide, please. For facilities in the program that were previously listed as a high priority, we've received their health risk assessments and the results of those assessments are listed here. Five facilities have an intermediate risk, which means their cancer risk was between one and 10 in a million or their hazard index score was between 0 0.1 and 1. Five facilities had a low risk, which means they had a cancer risk of less than 1 or a hazard index of less than 0 0.1. Next slide, please. For industry-wide facilities, the district analyzed and assessed 360 gas stations. Of those, 41% had an intermediate risk and 59% had a low risk. Next slide. Uh, the district also analyzed and assessed 805 engine only facilities. 53% uh, of those had an intermediate risk, 43% had a low risk, 3% reported no operation, and 1% had a high risk. 
For those ones that had a high risk, the Air District will be requesting additional information from those sources and we'll be asking them to assess, perform a health risk assessment. Uh, next slide, please. The other two categories of industry-wide facilities are chrome platers and dry cleaners. We have three, three chrome platers in the district. Uh, two of them emit hexavalent chromium and the other emits uh, just trivalent chromium. Uh, trivalent chromium is uh, not considered a cancer causing, so we're mainly, mainly focused on the two that emit hexavalent chromium. Uh, the other source is dry cleaners, and we don't have any more dry cleaners uh, subject to this regulation in our district because perchloroethylene has been phased out of California. Next slide, please. So what's next for the hotspots program? As the prioritization, risk assessment, and risk reduction process can take many years, the district will continue to review current core facilities, identify new core facilities through the emissions inventory and the annual reporting programs. Additionally, we will continue to screen and review industry-wide facilities and provide assistance to facilities in conducting health risk assessments or risk reduction plans. Also, we are working to incorporate the hotspots reporting and review requirements into the district's new online services program. And we will be returning next year to present the annual report and update the board on the program. Next slide, please. So with that, the 2024 report was published on September 25th and noticed on the district's website. Notice was also sent out to via the permitting listserv and the community air protection listserv. Uh, at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board and request that the board open the public hearing. Thank any you. questions? Hearing and seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the board at this time on this item? Hearing and seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. This is a receive and file. Thank you very much for the thorough report. Thank you. Next item, please. The next item on the agenda, item number 10, Greenfield Development in the Context of Achieving Air Quality and Climate Goals. And I have Paul Philly and Dov Caden with SACOG here in Chambers to give the presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning um, to the directors and chair. My name is Dov Caden. I work at SACOG on the land use side of our kind of long range plan. It's my uh, pleasure, along with Paul, to, to speak to you today about greenfield developments in the context of achieving our air quality and our climate goals. Slide, please. So this is a, a roadmap for, for today's discussion. I'm gonna provide some, some brief background on kind of the roles and responsibilities um, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our region. I'll tie that back to um, SB 375, which is the law that governs um, the, the plan that SACOG works on. Um, and uh, I'll hone in a little bit on how greenfield development does impact those goals. And then I'll turn it over to Paul to provide some, some examples and some case studies from this region to help kind of illustrate some of the challenges that are facing uh, greenfield development in the context of, of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, as well as to facilitate a uh, discussion on some solutions and opportunities. Slide, please. So greenhouse gas emissions come from a variety of sectors, of course, uh, which are shown on the bottom of this chart. And addressing them uh, is a shared responsibility across multiple entities, which are shown above the chart. So within our region, we have cities, counties, uh, utilities, air districts, SACOG, and others that all kind of have a, a role um, in, in developing strategies to reduce these emissions across each one of these sectors. As you know, the, the air district has a hand in mitigation across multiple sectors, um, including all of the pink on-road sources, which is the, the largest source of emissions in our region. That sector is, is mostly just made up of, of daily travel, to and from work, running errands, shepherding kids around, the, the collective daily travel of, of our region's households. The greenhouse gas emissions from that driving is determined by both the vehicle technology um, as well as just how much people are driving overall. The Air District is looking at all of that, uh, while SACOG is focused um, mostly on just how much we are driving, that driving part. At, at SACOG, our responsibility 
um, under state law, which again is governed by SB 375, is to develop a, a long-range plan, um, what we're calling in this cycle the 2025 blueprint, that integrates both land use and transportation planning to reduce emissions from that total driving sector. So specifically, uh, we have a task of a 19% per capita greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, from passenger vehicles targets. It's below 2005 levels, and we have to demonstrate that we can do that by 2035. So our plan um, must outline you know, a set of land use assumptions and transportation investments and strategies that can reduce the amount that people need to drive on a daily basis kind of for their daily needs. And we call that, that metric um, of total driving vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. We deliver that, that reduction in, in VMT through two primary mechanisms. The, the first is we're trying to, on average, reduce the distances between destinations over time, right? The, the trip lengths themselves. And then number two, we're also trying to provide residents with you know, uh, more transportation options that are convenient, that are safe, that are reliable to kind of give them the opportunity um, to, to leave their cars at home for some of those trips. Today's discussion revolves mostly around how we do that and, and the role of, of Greenfield in this discussion. Um, but before we do, do that, I really just want to briefly touch on the connection between um, VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, considering some the advancements that are happening in, in vehicle technology and, and zero emission vehicles. Slide, please. So one of the, the first things that, that comes up when we talk about a greenhouse gas emission target um, related to transportation is, well, what, what about electric vehicles? Doesn't that sort of um, fix the, the pink part of that previous graph? And, and over time, it is true, of course, that electric vehicles are, are going to have a tremendous potential um, to, to reduce greenhouse gas, em gas emissions from that transportation sector. Um, the state is, of course, developing standards for, for fuel efficiency. Um, you know, they're providing incentives for, for zero emission vehicle purchases. We have a, a target year as a state of 2035 for all new vehicles sold in the state to be zero emission vehicles. Um, however, that, that transition is, is going to take some time, and you can kind of see that on the, on the graph here. Even if all new vehicle sales are electric in 2035, gas-powered cars are going to make up a majority of the fleet for, for some time. And this is why the state is looking specifically to regions to kind of help uh, reduce emissions that are associated with, with VMT. The state would still be falling short of these kind of near-term 2035 climate goals without this multi-pronged approach. So the GHG target that's assigned to our region is, is part of that kind of overarching strategy um, uh, to kind of accelerate the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as we're kind of going through this transition over time to electric vehicles. Excuse me, Doug. Supervisor, I'm sorry, Director Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm one of those uh, directors that is going to have to leave here in seven minutes. Um, and it's just unfortunate timing because I think I'm the one that, yeah. that asked for uh, this presentation. Um, but I think this is an important slide and everything you just articulated is, um, I think is really at the crux of what I think is going to be some necessary um, legislative uh, policy discussion in earnest, probably in the not too distant future as I, this is me editorializing. Um, as a former CARB member and as someone that was uh, intimately uh, knowledgeable about uh, the crafting of SB 375, that, that policy intent that is uh, memorializing that statute to me is um, slowly fading in terms of its um, uh, efficacy and necessity. And, and it has to do with the fact that more and more market share think goodness is moving to zero emission uh, vehicles. Um, and I understand the argument about the fact that we're, we're still going to have um, internal combustion engine uh, vehicles out there for some time, and their market share is going to uh, necessarily shrink. But when we talk about how do we balance that with VMT, are we talking about it in the gross sense? Are we talking about it um, in the sense that as we grow our, our greenfield communities, and there will be greenfield growth, no doubt about it, um, how are we going to honestly uh, account for the fact that, yeah, you might have more gross VMT because you're adding, you're adding more people that have to travel one way or another, whether it's internal combustion engine or, or zero emission. 
but at the same time, as the market share continues to grow for for zero emission vehicle, at some point you're going to reach a point hypothetically where you have greenfield development that yes puts more miles traveled, but could hypothetically be all zero emission. So at that point, um, the the conversation about what the what this does in terms of climate change becomes very convoluted. And so uh, I would just like to understand, especially as it relates to this second kind of paragraph here, uh, what are we talking about, gross or, or something else? Sure, so the, the VMT that we measure is on a per capita basis, as is the GHG from transportation. So it's, it's not a, a gross amount, it is, it is a um, per capita basis. But you are hitting on a, a humongous challenge um, as, a, as it relates to 375. And, and I haven't even brought up the gas tax issue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and I don't know, I, I might uh, invite some of my colleagues to jump up to kind of opine on some of the, the future of SB 375, but this is certainly a topic that we've had a, a lot of conversations um, with the SACOG board about in terms of what does that look like in terms of the, the beyond 2035 year as we get closer to that date. Yeah, uh, James Corliss, Executive Director of SACOG. Uh, obviously, uh, Director Cerna, um, you've got a lot of experience in this. I will say, as some of our SACOG board members know, uh, the four largest MPOs just sent a letter to the California Air Resources Board kind of outlining a little bit of what you just said, which is um, we actually think there's been a lot of benefits overall for SB 375, but it's now 16 years old. It gets to a target year of 2035 that it, by our next plan update would probably be six years away and in, including things like that you just spoke to on the slide. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, uh, as again, some of our board members know, stay tuned on this. Um, I think we are now beginning to engage in a working group with the state, uh, the MPOs, local government, Caltrans, California Transportation Commission, CARB, and many others to figure out what does the future of this look like because in some ways the 2008 law has run its course. I would say I would one of the many discussions is moving the target year back because you can't do a long range planning uh, law if you've only got six years to, to hit a target. But I do think the other thing that we should be mindful of is, as we can see in some of the other more recent laws, is a shift from greenhouse gas emissions to a VMT target because of the conflation of these two things. Thank you for that. And, and if I may just point out, uh, Director Cernan, because you are the one that asked this question and we brought this item for you, um, if it's okay with the chair, I mean, we'd be happy to come back and make sure that we complete the conversation. Um, as you pointed out, it is a complex issue. Mm -hmm. um, we like electrification of transportation because if we can put 100% renewable energy into that transportation, you zero out the carbon and the air pollution, right? But as Mr. Corliss said, SB 375 is about VMT reductions. So there are some, there's room for improvement. And, and I, you know, I asked the question for a lot of different reasons, but one of, one of them that I think is really important for all of us in our other capacities for our, our home jurisdictions as city council members or, or members of the board of supervisors is when we are uh, working in the capacity exercising land use authority, um, Oftentimes, we'll hear opposition to proposed projects that some of which is all steeped in the VMT argument. And so the more and more we get to kind of this threshold moment where is SB 375 actually accomplishing what it set out to do because the market share has shifted so much for zero emission vehicles, for me at least, the, the, the opposition um, positions out there that are um, you know, balancing on the fulcrum of, of VMT uh, begin to kind of lose their, their impact. And it's important for us as, you know, the, the, uh, the governing bodies exercising that land use control to really understand what those positions are and what they aren't. And, that, and it's, it has everything to do with this slide. So. Director Serena, if I could, because you have to leave. Um, I think the other thing, the thing that's very important is I would say SB 375 has kind of got us all obsessed with greenhouse gas emissions, right? And, and rightly or wrongly, but it, it really has. 
There are many other reasons why we don't want to have excessive vehicle miles traveled. It translates into traffic congestion. It translates into a need for transportation projects that, frankly, we don't have the budget to afford. Right? And so part of the reason we wanted to begin this discussion, per many of your requests, is how can we get development in this region, infill or greenfield, that actually thoughtfully and smartly reduces the demand um, and, and that is in some ways, I would say, over and above or separate from the greenhouse gas SB375. And, and I'm, I'm really glad, James, that you, you mentioned that because you're absolutely right. VMT does have a lot of different implications. I mean, uh, Supervisor Desmond probably feels the pain the most in his district because of the amount of potholes in the unincorporated county, right? So it does, I mean, a pothole can be created as much by a zero emission vehicle as it can a, you know, a diesel truck. So. Um, that, that, that's understood, but it be, at some point it becomes somewhat almost dishonest to say we should continue to have the shield of uh, reducing VMT because of the, the, uh, because of the zero emission vehicle argument. So that, that's... It has, it has certainly confused the argument, I would suggest, yes. Yeah. Again, I apologize for having to step away, but uh, I, I do appreciate you bringing this back. I, I wouldn't ask you to, to redo it for the entire board and, and have, uh, have you use everyone's time to do that. But perhaps we can do a, uh, a meeting, James and, and uh, Dr. Ayala, to maybe further vet this a little, a little further. All right, thank you. All right, please continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe just to, to put a bow on this slide here, while, while EVs matter for climate, um, gas-powered cars are going to be around for a while, and so hitting our greenhouse gas targets will require reducing VMT, at least in the shir short term. And so, so how do we reduce VMT? Well, b based on decades of work on this, we know that addressing VMT means that we have to address the, the land use question, how and where the region is growing over time. Slide, please. And of particular importance is how much is the region growing outward through greenfield development and, and what does that greenfield development actually look like? This is perhaps um, the most important question for, for us at SACOG as we think about reducing emissions from passenger vehicles um, in the context of SB 375. So w when we say greenfield development, it's a little bit of a subjective term, um, but we're generally talking about development that's on the periphery of the existing urban footprint of the region that's kind of expanding that footprint outward. Slide, please. And in the context of, of VMT, that means that you, know, you aren't as close to um, where people need to go, right? Uh, w which requires households to travel further distances to get um, to where they need to go. So, so places with lots of stuff nearby on the flip side, you know, particularly places that are more centrally located, you know, maybe you can travel in multiple directions to get to where you need to go. Um, they tend to have lower VMT than average. And um, slide, please. This phenomenon is, is borne out in our um, slides that we're cycling through here. These are 2012, 2016, and 2020 VMT maps. Um, and you have you know, green that's kind of below regional average, orange and red that are above it. And you, know, you can kind of think of this as, um, it's like gravity, right, where the, you have nodes with the most destinations. These are places with a mix of both jobs as well as services and restaurants. And um, they, they act as a magnet to households across the region. And then the further you are from those magnets, the further you need to, to travel to get there. Sl slide, please. And I think the, the first large point um, you know, that I'd like to make is that all else equal, the regional location of the greenfield uh, really matters for its VMT. So I'm going to use an example here of two greenfield projects that are under construction in the SACOG region right now. The colors represent planned land uses. Um, so light tan is you know, more single family, darker brown, more um, you know, multifamily, and red commercial green parks. And on first glance, they, they look relatively similar, right, with a mix of densities and uses. You know, if anything, maybe the plan on the left is like a little bit more uh, dense. Um, however, slide please, when you look at how people are traveling in these areas, you know, in 2050, after, you know, the vast majority of these areas are built out, the VMT is actually close to double the regional average, um, you know, some of the highest in the region for the plan on the left, while the one on the right is right around re regional average. 
So um, what happened? Well, you know, if you live in the area on the left, you have to travel a pretty good distance to get to most of your destinations. Um, while the area on the right, you have um, you know, a, a large industrial uh, job center immediately to the north. You have Stockton Boulevard with all of the restaurants that that provides about three miles to the west. You, know, you have Elk Grove to the south. You have spatial efficiency. And it's not that, in, in this case, right, that everyone is taking transit or, or biking to every destination, although those are you know, important components of low VMT, as, as Paul will talk about. Um, it's more that the vehicle trips that they are taking are just shorter than the community on the left. So the point here is that for, for the purposes of planning for lower VMT in greenfields, the, the location can sometimes be really hard to, to overcome if you're just really far from um, where people need to go and there isn't this kind of existing base of destinations that is in, in relatively close proximity. Slide, please. So the second larger point before I turn it over is, is while the regional location is, is really important as a factor for VMT, there's also many things that a greenfield development can do to influence the VMT of households that live there. And, and interestingly, um, many of the solutions that we look to deploy to reduce VMT in greenfields are the same principles that the SACOG region adopted in the original blueprint um, 20 years ago. So the blueprint principles you see on the screen, you know, these were not explicitly about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, right? They, they were rather to kind of address general air quality issues, um, congestion, um, you know, conversion of rural and working lands, the overall quality of life metrics, right? And they, they happen to be great VMT strategies, but they also, you know, to James's point earlier, they help to accomplish other goals that, that both of our agencies care about. Um, so, so for example, reducing VMT actually reduces air pollution, even if all the vehicles are EVs, right? Because you, you still get less brake and tire particles in the air, which actually, you know, some re research indicates um, will be worse with EVs because the vehicles themselves are heavier. So, so there's just, there are many reasons to be reducing BMT beyond greenhouse gas emissions. But setting regional location aside, the primary ways to, to reduce VMT in a greenfield um, are, to, are to plan for a more complete community and not a bedroom community, to sort of embrace a lot of these principles that you see on the screen. The, there is no inherent reason, right, that, that a greenfield development has to be planned as a bedroom community of, of mostly large lot single family homes and nothing else. What, what folks will, would typically think about as sprawl, right? There are several you know, planned communities and greenfields in our region that really are embracing these ideas. And you know, key features um, uh, that kind of embrace the blueprint principles that we know reduce VMT are kind of ensuring that there is a, a mix of uses with a balance of jobs and services and housing, quality design um, with, with more kind of grid patterns, less cul-de-sacs, more housing choices with a mix of single family, but also townhomes, small scale multifamily apartments, um, vertical mixed use. And, and this more compact um, built environment with, with vibrancy and, and density um, and quality design means that yes, your, your vehicle trips are shorter, um, but it also helps to facilitate uh, one of the blueprint principles that we have, um, transportation choices, right? Choices to, to travel beyond just the car. And, and that is because you know, if, you are, if you live on a quarter acre lot um, and everything around you is, is single family, um, you're, you're more likely to be a good distance from, from schools, from grocery stores, um, from restaurants, for your, from your job. And so yes, those trip lengths are, are long, um, and, but there's also just not really another viable option for you to, to do your travel other than to use a car. If you conversely live in more of a gridded neighborhood, higher densities, mix of uses, um, suddenly, you know, transit can become more viable for the transit agency to provide, um, and, and maybe some of your trips are possible via, via walking and biking. And, and it's that combination of both the shorter trips um, as, as well as, you know, these, these transportation options that is kind of facilitating the, the lower VMT environment. So just to kind of sum up my, my points, um, there, there are different government entities that are responsible for different pieces of the climate mitigation pie. Um, but SACOG and the Air District overlap in our role of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from vehicle miles traveled, and then the Air District is looking at a few things beyond that. As it relates to greenfield development, uh, the location really matters for, for VMT, with some locations being very challenging to, to overcome, even with smart planning. 
And then that said, there are just many things that we can do in the, in the planning of Greenfield to reduce their VMT, mostly revolving around this idea of the complete community with a mix of compact jobs, uh, homes, and services. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you kindly. Um, so I'm Paul Philly, um, Program Manager of the Transportation and Climate Change Division here at the Air District, and I have had the um, pleasure and joy of being a professional planner in this region for 17 years. And I am now finally of the age where a lot of the stuff I worked on as a junior way back in the day is starting to build out and finish up. And it's been interesting to see what worked, what didn't, and sort of the outcomes of these plans, uh, especially since I really started it around 2008 when there's been a lot of um, uh, disruption, I think is, is a good way to play it. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason I sort of exist, um, or at least the sequent land use exists here at the Air District is back in the early 90s, there was additional air quality regulations out of EPA and the feds. And we decided that as a region, we were going to look at our land use and construction sectors and try to get emission reductions out of those. And the big catalyst to that was the 1993 general plan adopted by Sacramento County, which was measure uh, policy AQ15. So all projects that have a significant impact uh, from development would get a 15% reduction in their ozone precursors. This was then later adopted by almost all of the jurisdictions uh, within the county, and the land use team has been involved in helping jurisdictions craft those air quality mitigation plans and greenhouse gas reduction plans. Typically, they're created by the developer or the project proponent. The Air District verifies to make sure that they are full of good substantial evidence and would hold up in uh, a CEQA suit, and then they're typically approved by the local jurisdiction who then implements it, and then we occasionally assist with your implementation as those plans move forward. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to I say is that development takes a long time. Um, like when you approve something, it's going to be a while before we finally put the final nail into the final house. Uh, these are two different aerial photos of developments within the region. And especially the one on the right, you can see that they've done mass grading. You can see that they've got backbone infrastructure, and that was in 2004. And then the next one is in 2023, and there are still blank spaces. It's still building out. And so oftentimes when we have our estimated build out dates, it can be earlier, it can be very later. And the issue with that is as the neighborhood builds out, you typically start with the pieces that have the highest VMT, your single family homes. Then you bring in your other pieces that lower the VMT. And I'm gonna ask uh, Madam Clerk to go to the next slide to demonstrate that. So here is one in the region. It has a qualified air, you know, air quality mitigation plan, started their mass grading back in 2004. And it was five years later before they got their first commercial serving use, which was a drugstore and the elementary school. So before that, everybody had to go um, up into different parts of the city to do their schooling, to do their shopping, to do all of their things. It was a, a very busy drugstore. We actually had to go into the county for a lot of the, for the schools and some of the other things. My house is in the northwest corner of this, of this map. <laughs> So, and I think all five council members were there for the ribbon cutting because it was a big deal. Um, it was about seven years later after that drugstore that we started to get the trail system was finally built out because you don't want to build infrastructure before you need it. So now the people in the south part could walk to the parks and other services in the north part. And then another two years later, you get the full shopping center, you get the second elementary school, you get the, the park that has all the ball fields and playful things, and you're starting to get this complete community. And as you do this, the VMT is starting to come down. But today, we still don't have a junior high or high school nearby. I think it's 12 miles. So if I am at your house and I catch the school bus there, and thank God there is a school bus, it's 6.50 to get to the junior high for my 8.30 first period class. And that's the first school bus. There's actually about 14 that pick up yeah. these there, days. There is a lot of different school buses that go by through there. And as more people, as this continues to build out, eventually the school district will build, hopefully, uh, a junior high and a high school. And then you can have a complete neighborhood. And we won't have these long trips for students. And we won't have these higher VMTs. So this has been a 20-year story of this neighborhood building out. And that's... Something that we need to be thoughtful and intentional is we want to try to compress that timeline as much as possible or put these neighborhoods in places where there is already access to these amenities so you don't have to wait 
20 years. Uh, as an example for me personally, uh, my house was built in 1994, and the neighborhood library is getting built in 2026, maybe. Uh, God willing, and the bond passes. So that's, that's sort of where we are on, on the completion. If the school bond these. passes this year, the high school, middle school would be built in five years. Yeah. It would be open in five years. So there's a lot, of, a lot that goes to make a complete community. So anytime we can have access to complete communities in our greenfields, uh, you don't have this risk of bonds failing or, or other issues happening. Uh, next slide, please. This is sort of borne out in um, SACOG's information. So this is a current 2035 look. And again, I know there's a lot of uh, thoughts about what a 2035 target really means, but when we look at a CEQA document, we typically have the baseline and then we have the full build out. But SACOG's targets don't wait for the build out, they have a specific year. So in 2035, our existing communities are below regional average, our developing communities are going to be above regional average because a lot of them won't be finished by 2035. And the ones that we're approving today or have approved and haven't started yet are going to be even higher in 2035 because they're sort of at that initial genesis where you're just building the single family homes without amenities. Next slide, please. Now here's one um, that is essentially built out, uh, used to be a greenfield back in 1994, and it pretty much developed according to the plan. You did have jobs and industry north of the community. You had commercial going in. The town center didn't quite develop, but most of the amenities and trail systems happened. But if you look over at the VMT map that I put in the side, it's still a little bit above regional average and certainly higher than the rest of the jurisdiction. And a big part of that is because if you look around it, there is uh, open space, industrial uses that don't provide a lot of amenities for a neighborhood. So even if you try to create a complete community, sometimes the market won't be enough for you to get all of the uses that you're hoping for even 30 years later. And so people will have to leave for those types of things. So when you island your communities a little bit and focus them on certain transportation corridors, you are going to get different VMT outcomes, even with somewhat, you know, a pretty robust design. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is a community that is building out very quickly. It's probably the fastest one that I've seen. Um, Backbone started back in 2012, and 10 years later, we've already got more than 8,000 people living in the community. And it had a very robust transportation plan when it initially went forward, but it still hasn't quite been implemented yet. And there's also been some changes to the plan where it's going to become a bit more of a health center and health hub rather than what was originally planned. So the region and jurisdiction went and got a, a new planning grant so that we can be really thoughtful about getting the transit in. Um, what we have to remember is that it takes a lot of intentionality in our new growth communities to make sure that we are able to get transit out there, we are able to get transportation demand management services. Um, just like with the school bonds, the completion of these communities and integration into the transit network just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of jurisdictional focus and additional resources. And so even in communities that are building fast, it still takes additional actions to make sure that we get the transit out there and we get the other amenities and usefulness to it and as markets change, the plans are going to change. And so it's really incumbent upon jurisdictions to be reactive and proactive um, so that we can get low VMT pieces. I, I just wanted to ask, could you tell us, for those of us with curious minds, what community this is? We can, um, I can. We, we intentionally took off the names, but uh, this is uh, Folsom Ranch, which is south of 50. Okay. All right. That would have been the, okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Speaking of changing plans, occasionally a lot of these are even beyond your control, uh, um, even here as uh, supervisors or directors. Um, this is a, a project that was approved uh, back in 2005 that had an elementary school as its heart. And the school district decided not to build the elementary school there and put it about a half mile north of the neighborhood. And so a lot of the VMT associated with having those kids walk to school uh, didn't quite, or VMT reductions didn't quite pan out. Uh, there's also supposed to be a park adjacent to that school, and without the school, there wasn't really need to build the park. 
Uh, and there was other infrastructure that was originally envisioned for this larger area that became too cost prohibitive as development and time went on. So some of the sustainable mode crossings of the local interstate didn't quite happen. So the VMT of this neighborhood ended up a bit higher than it was originally planned to have because of a lot of factors beyond the control of the jurisdiction. And there's cost, there's market forces, there's, there's lots of reasons it happened this way. Um, but we did end up getting higher VMT than expected during the build out of this particular community. And that is sort of a risk if you either lose that intentionality or if you don't have really good coordination with all of the pieces that you're expecting. Next slide, please. So this is um, how can we reduce greenfield emissions? And it's also, I think, I love this slide because it really sort of shows the disconnect between uh, air district and jurisdictions in SACOG. When we originally started doing our air quality mitigation plans, most of our measures were really focused on mobile sources and vehicle miles traveled. That was the intention behind it. Most of the measures were associated with those. And it's great because it addresses conventional pollutants, it addresses greenhouse gases, and it addresses VMT. As those VMT reductions got more difficult and our targets got a little bit more harder to reach, we started seeing a shift when you're approving your CEQA documents from just looking at the VMT, especially before SB 743, which was the new VMT law, to looking at technology as a way to get greenhouse gas reductions and um, criteria pollution reductions and then building energy and operation reductions. Think about no natural gas or no NOx appliances or other pieces that are associated with the building itself and not necessarily associated with the mobile sources. And finally, we have seen projects come forward and just do credits where they can't get the emission reductions on site and so they buy them from elsewhere and that has no VMT benefits. And most of the mitigations that we're starting to see are moving away from VMT benefits and are more focused on things that the developer and the jurisdiction can control. Because there is less risk of did you install natural gas piping or not as opposed to in 20 years is this neighborhood going to build out the way we hope it's going to build out. So that's a big issue is if SACOG needs VMT reductions and your plans are starting to move away from that we're, we're starting to see sort of a breakdown in our ability to hit those targets or at least use air quality plans and greenhouse gas plans to achieve VMT targets. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, I can give you an example that's just recently happened. Oh, forgive me, uh, I was supposed to talk about the technology. But in general, hearths, uh, food preparation, water heating, space heating, zero emission technologies, uh, and offsite mitigation, we, we have been seeing more of these as it becomes more difficult to get VMT benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So very recently, uh, there was a plan approved back in 2008 that relied on a very robust uh, active modes network with uh, very expensive pedestrian bridges and bike trails. And right now, it's very expensive to do that kind of construction. And it was falling out of feasibility for the developer. So the air district and the jurisdiction, the developer amended the plan so that they would go with uh, zero NOx appliances and restricting natural gas. And if you have an all electric smud home, which definitely pencils in smud territory, we have incredible rates, very cost effective, uh, you reduce about 19% of your NOx uh, just by eliminating the natural gas burning. So they removed the bridges and took them to grade and they replaced those estimated emission reductions with technology. So you might, a little bit of VMT got lost in the wash, but air quality and climate was kept whole, but it makes it harder for the SB 375 target to be achieved. Uh, next slide, please. So this is sort of the, the summary of observations of, again, serving this community for 17 years, is that development takes a long time. And the stuff you start on, it's, especially these larger projects, it's gonna be a minute and that greenfield developments are gonna have higher VMT per capita when they start, and then those per capita figures will go down as the community gets finished, because right now you guys are pretty good about designing good blueprint communities when they're done. It takes a while to get them done, but even when they are done, if they're sort of an island or if they're out by themselves or if they're far from a regional center or if they don't have a really good uh, regional transit connection, you're going to have higher communities, even complete, than a typical infill community. 
Um, the other thing is the market is consistently changing. And these plant, right, we've uh, gone real gangbusters on fulfillment centers. And we've seen office go down. And uh, a lot of your plans have come in and said, we're going to build a health uh, hub instead of a, a town center. And that's OK. We want to ha that's good jobs, that's good access. But we need to make sure that our transportation plans and other things continue so that we can keep VMT and emissions whole uh, as we continue to shape our region to fit the needs of the region. And finally, especially before SB 743, because most of the plans we're talking about were approved before then, uh, it was all about carbon and uh, greenhouse gases and air quality and emissions and not necessarily VMT. I think the post SB 743 plans are starting to grapple with it a little bit better, but we're very, you know, we've been doing air quality plans for 40 years and VMT is still sort of a new science at the CEQA level. And so that's where we get a disconnect between SACOG, which has this regional VMT obligation, and then you at your local jurisdictions, which has a very long lead time to hit your VMT targets, whereas they've got, what, six years now? Some, 11. Yeah, 11, yeah. okay. Sorry, I'm not good at math, that's why I had it. I'm not the, yeah, I'm not the engineer, I'm the planner. Next slide, please. So to sort of sum up, um, considerations that we'd like you to take back to your home jurisdictions is when you are looking at new growth areas, try to phase your project entitlement and development to complete your existing communities. Um, it's better to have sort of one complete community than two incomplete communities. So really accelerating that build out as much as you can would be ideal. Two, and then blueprint principles. Uh, we've been doing this for decades. It works. Uh, we can see VMT going down as these blueprint communities finish up. But it is important to think about where those blueprint communities are as we build them out. And then finally, something that we're probably going to want to start thinking about is sort of a contingency measure. And I shouldn't have used that word today. Um, but as our plans change, we need to be thinking about more than just ozone and carbon, but we may need to be thinking about VMT, especially if you've already got a DOT that is having trouble taking care of roads or congestion issues. So when we do our amendments, we do need to be thinking about what is it doing to our transportation system and our air quality goals and our climate goals. So we've got lots of people available for questions. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I yield to Vice Chair Aquino. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. And yes, I recognize that slide from Folsom Ranch. <laughs> Do we have any questions or comments? I, I will just um, say, and I I've talked a little bit about this with Dr. Ayala, but you, you know, you're talking about blueprint principles, but I would like to tie in for us um, blue zone principles. And I know, I think Sacramento County has a grant for this, but um, this idea that there are places around the world where people, an, an inordinate number of people are living to age 100 and they're living very well. And I, what I think is so fascinating is the things that, that they've identified as these blue zone principles, um, you know, a, a mostly vegetarian diet, um, uh, natural movement because you're walking or you're biking or whatever, um, um, a strong social network, you know, gathering places, those things actually are all also very good for, for air quality, right? And so I'd like to kind of bring this thing full circle and, um, and, and have a conversation next year about blue zones and Sacramento County's effort to, um, I think, to turn you into a blue zone. The other thing is um, just, you know, as somebody who, who uh, my district in Folsom Includes a little bit north of the freeway, but everything south of the freeway. Um, and so, you know, hearing all of the, the community feedback about the greenfield development, but even the infield development that you try to do in the city and, and adding housing to our, what we call our central business district, to try to make it a walkable community. Then we get pushed back from the public about that too, about why, why we're adding housing and, you know, so it's, it's sometimes you just feel like you can't win. <laughs> I, I will make a, a, a few comments and I, I appreciate this presentation because actually I think it delved into some things that really weren't part of the discussion frankly at, at SACOG. I mean it touched on things maybe a little differently but during our land use assumptions uh, discussion that we had quite a spirited discussion. But as someone who's as I, I really appreciate 
uh, um, Director Cerna bringing this issue up of the tension between uh, SB 350 and what it was trying to accomplish and now the changes with ZEVs and then how does that factor in now with, yeah, the market is, is increasing the, the level of uh, ZEV, uh, um, zero emission vehicles, but we still have the VMT issue. How does that all get factored in? And it is convoluted. Um, and something that, that you mentioned, I think Paul, maybe it was Paul or, or Dom mentioned how uh, all these barriers to creating the complete communities, right? I mean, things that, that are beyond our control as a local jurisdiction, right? What the schools do. But that's not unique to these developing communities. That also happens in the infill areas too, where school districts all of a sudden, there's no more school bus service anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're increasing more VMT, more vehicle trips in these built out areas as a result of that. So that is not, that does, I, I wanna just, plant that seed, because it does happen in the infill areas as well. And I also want to plant the seed that, you know, Paul, you also made reference to a DOT who is having a problem keeping up with its maintenance needs. I'm assuming you were talking about Sacramento <laughs> County, which has the biggest uh, maintenance needs on our roads, roadways. I think it's $1.4 billion at last count. Um, that is a huge issue in impacting our ability to track infill development by having the better our roadways are the easier it is for us to attract more infill development so that is part and parcel of other discussions we have at say cog and and will be having you know more next year i'm looking at my my friend here uh, james corliss about this issue which he knows is near and dear to my heart um but i guess you know another thing for you paul is what would you say are some good measures or I guess state-of-the-art measures to ensure some of the certainty that these communities upon completion will be fully complete and will incorporate uh, a lot of these amenities that will ensure uh, much lower VMT for these communities. What, what, are, what are some things maybe that we're not thinking of? You know, Sacramento County, we have, our, we have that land use policy, LU120, and I think that's a, a really good policy. But again, there are some things outside of our control. What are some, some really new innovative things you're seeing that will ensure these amenities are included and these communities are, are, are fully built out? One that or I've fully complete, I should say. So one is is to make sure that the community itself passes um, the sniff test, I guess, in the sense of looking at what's going to be penciling and profitable now and into the future and finding ways so that there is a market to support that. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, very ambitious infill plans that never quite came to fruition just because there wasn't a market there to support it. And coupling it with a government investor or SACO grant funding or other things, if you think about the places where infill has been successful, it's usually compared and coupled with a SACO grant. I'm thinking uh, West Sacramento as an example when they did the ballpark and the uh, roadways and other pieces. Uh, Folsom has had a lot of intentionality with their uh, Folsom South of 50, really making sure that there is a lot of resources going in there. Um, not every jurisdiction has resources to focus, but also including triggers as part of your development agreements. So by the 300th house, you will do X. By the 400th house, you will do Y. By the fifth, you know, 500th house, you will do Z. And occasionally even taking out bonds or other financing methods. Uh, I do know some developers will go ahead and just do a really big Melarus, but the, you get the clubhouse, you get the parks, you get everything when it opens, and then that helps raise their marketability and make sure that there are local serving communities. Um, retail is getting difficult. Uh, it's getting kind of aspirational, honestly. And part of that is I'm looking at some new developments and typically we would just do pedestrian cut throughs and green belts and biking systems, which is great. I'm a big proponent of cycling and electric bikes, but making sure that there are still ways for the Amazon truck, the UPS truck, the postal truck, all of these commercial delivery VMTs are going up. If they can still also have direct access to communities, we would see a reduction in commercial VMT, which is a bit, it's, it's grown a lot, right? Okay, I want, if, if, I, if I delve into that subject, I wanna check with the experts. But it's our initial planning stages, you really need to be very clear about what the expectations are and when things are going to happen, and if they don't, then a conversation happens. And that's what happened with uh, the, the last example I brought, where by, I believe it was 20% build out, they had to have that pedestrian network completed. Wasn't gonna happen. And so they at least had to go back to the jurisdiction to have a conversation about what are we gonna do about not being able to meet this. 
and the jurisdiction decided that uh, this was the best way to go because it was an air quality mitigation plan. It wasn't a active modes plan. It wasn't a VMT reduction plan. So be really clear about what your goals are for these plans. Have triggers as the community builds out to make sure that you're getting what you need when you need it. And then that at least gives you a point of discussion uh, if something can't happen. Okay. I, no, I mean, that's helpful. I, I mean, I think some of the... Some of the Greenfield communities on the Jackson Corridor um, were certainly are incorporating some of these into those, absolutely, uh, some of those triggers. But that you give me some additional food for thought, so thank you. Thank you. Director Terry. You, you brought something up that just made me think that I wanted to ask the question. Amazon, UPS, Postal Service is probably not going to be fleet replacing as quickly as, as a lot of these private sector ones were, are. But as we've talked about that, too, where as somebody who lived in one of the examples that was zoned by the county, not by our city. So we do have these triggers and some of the stuff that we actually got to zone, but um, having lived in a place that is still slowly growing and doing all those things, what is the, or who is taking account, and I don't know if this is, Jim, a, a question for you, um, is th the fleet replacement of these delivery services is gonna happen way faster than the general public fleet re replacement. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Amazon trucks that are going around my, my house are, are electric now. Um, is that being taken into, into account as we talk about the shift in retail and that kind of stuff that, that those fleets are going to be replaced on their own anyways because it's more efficient, and, and especially in this region? Or does, is that even a consideration under the current laws? Well, maybe we can tag team this, but uh, so unfortunately, so SB 375 is specific to greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicles specifically. Oh, yeah. okay. So so commercial fleets would not be considered under SB 375. However, the Air District probably has a hand in this. So we are, from a, from a good planning standpoint, it, I think we all want to have reductions in VMT. And we want to have commerce happen in the region as efficiently as possible. And so if those fleet VMTs do go down, we do see less energy use. And the larger trucks also have more wear on roads. They have more PM2.5 from brake wear and tire wear and other aspects. So there are health benefits to making sure that um, the commerce fleet is as efficient as possible in reducing VMT. Okay, thank you. Director Hume. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Obviously, I could wax philosophical on this topic uh, ad nauseum, literally. And Paul, you and I probably came up around the same time to where we have seen things that were 2D ideas that have now grown into 3D communities and some worked out better than others. And so I just want to point out a couple of things um, relative to my personal experience and, and, and also what you, you showed on these slides. And that is in one of those pictures uh, that showed Laguna West, that at the time was really, I mean, the smart growth poster child of, you know, planning wonks that uh, this is what we're going to do and it's going to be fantastic. It's the new 21st century version. And yet you show 20 years later what developed and what has yet to develop. And unfortunately, what has yet to develop are all the dense projects that would be, drive the market forces that would then bring the commercial. That, and so it, it's kind of to your point about a self-fulfilling prophecy of if it doesn't come to be, then those goals uh, are never realized. Conversely, uh, the tale of two specific plans in Elk Grove, um, the first one that developed, by, it was zoned by the county and developed during the white hot uh, real estate market and built out faster than anyone ever projected and infrastructure did not keep up and it was an absolute mess. Uh, and so then the pendulum swings and Elk Grove has this great idea and we're going to demand that all the infrastructure, backbone infrastructure be put into place ahead of development so that it's there as things start to come to be. And just about the time that that backbone infrastructure was put into place, the Great Recession hit, the wheels fell off, and that albatross was almost enough to sink the largest land developer in the region. Um, and, and so I, I just say that is that, you know, the best laid plans don't always come to be uh, as we put out there. But I want to call attention to uh, a couple of the, the observations on, on the slide that you said about greenfield development. And this is a point that I've been making at SACOG. Specifically that you say that some greenfield development will have higher VMT per capita uh, during build out than it will when it's finished. 
And so that's one point to consider, is that when we look at these bite-sized chunks for our planning purposes, we're gonna have things, if we meet out um, a certain number of projected uh, 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 units, it's gonna throw us out of compliance in the short term, whereas the projected long term maybe takes us back the other way. So that's, that's an important consideration. And then the other one, uh, not only was bullet three on your uh, observations uh, bullets, but it was also kind of goes back to the original um, green and golden pink, uh, um, you know, uh, honeycomb from the uh, region uh, that, you know, some greenfield development by the very nature of their location will have higher VMT than others. And so, you know, all greenfields are equal, but some greenfields are more equal than others. And, uh, and, and, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, as, as we look at that, that's what the language that I'm trying to get injected into this will recognize, is that, that it is not all the same, and that, and that some green fields really border on green fill development that, that meets a demand, but it does so in a way that helps us not go further out of whack on some of these goals. And then the last thing I'll say is that uh, right now in Sacramento County, we have a green field development literally coming out of the ground that hopefully, if it can withstand market forces and, and stick to their ideological principles, has the potential to uh, really uh, be a proof of concept to turn the paradigm of development on its head and focus on that commercial, that compact development, the transit, the, the zero emission um, transportation options first and then move into the more tra traditional absorption of uh, single family and lower density development. So. It's a moving target for sure, but I just, I, I'm glad to hear, and I think that Mr. Corliss and I have had these discussions that, you know, we need to look at how do we bake into some of these targets the, the realization that this does take a long time. And I've always told people that, going back to days serving on LAFCO, that when somewhere is annexed, that does not mean that the earth movers are fired up the next day, right? I mean, this is a, and that's why it's such a speculative business at the end of the day. So thank you for the presentation. It's very informative, and I appreciate the, the um, my colleagues. Thank you. Did you want to finish up with something? Hume, thanks for bringing this up at the SACOG board. And I wanted to, first of all, really want to appreciate the partnership that we've had here with the Air District. Uh, you, you all asked us the same question, apparently, so fancy that. Um, <laughs> we're going to bring this presentation uh, back to the uh, SACOG board in November uh, for information. So to have a broader conversation with the, with the, starting with the Land Use Committee. And then Director Hume, as you have referenced, you've asked us to dig into some specifics in terms of what might this mean going forward for future plans, and we aim to do that by December. And I just wanted to give you my, my own quick observations on all of this, which many of which are informed by, by uh, Paul and Dov here. Um, the, the first is, um, and I know we've, we've had this discussion, but we often see these, a lot of these development proposals really rely on some kind of a transit service provided in this county, obviously by SACRT or a shuttle, and that would be wonderful, right? But I think as part of the theme you've heard here is the best laid plans over time. It is very, very difficult to make that work. It is often costly, so we should be eyes wide open on that. Um, uh, what we do know also is that when we lay any kind of uh, street infrastructure down, that is it. You have that grid, you have that street pattern forever. And coming back after the fact is impossible. So paying attention to active modes, paying attention to how we can build in the blue zone concept of, of, of getting people naturally to walk and bike. And I don't think we've seen enough of that. I, I, I do believe the, you know, the tide may be turning. We have some developments that I think are better than others. But you know, walled communities where people can't even walk out of there, you know, that's, we know that's going to really hamper it. We also know, obviously, that, that, as you said, that location is really key to drive the VMT piece of this. Um, there's things you can over, do to overcome that. Uh, but I, and I'm not saying we can't make shuttles and transit work. I just think if we really want to dig into this, um, it is, this is, uh, it's a challenge worth taking on, but it is not an easy one. No. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you all. Very, very interesting. Lots of food for thought. Any other comments? No. Okay. Um, board ideas, comments, and AB 1234 reports. Anyone? No. Uh, Selena, do we have anybody here for public comment? I'm assuming no. All right. Then it's 1044 and we are adjourned. Thank you.